Thank you, Jane. Thanks for playing. I never got back to you about telling all of you. Oh, well, I knew you just got involved with other people. Well, I did, and but if I, when I finally talked to him, I realized he wasn't going to be here. So thank you. church it was from a psalm passage um something about is it you, is this it you are my hiding place? yes yeah does that sound familiar to you oh no, i remember i it's been so long since i heard that song uh -huh. i think that's how the chorus goes right yeah well that was the only thing we ever really learned about oh, it man I lo i've heard that before I, that's it's not in our songbook i just know Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to Bible Baptist Church. Good to have you here tonight. Thank you for coming. Uh, those of you that are online, thank you for joining us. And let's let's stand and we'll open in prayer. I want you to be praying for uh, Serena and for Mike. Both of them have COVID. Aww. And um, pray, pray for a quick recovery there. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. And thank you for the good morning service. Thank you for the visitors. Thank you for the fellowship that we had around your word. And uh, for the singing, and, and Lord, we just pray for a great night tonight. Uh, we pray that you'd bless those that are, cannot be with us, that are joining us online, um, bless those that drop in, and just use your word tonight. Uh, Father, we want to be fed from your heavenly word, the manna, and I pray, Father, that that you would take this servant of God, this servant of yours, Jeremiah, that you used in such a mighty way um, from your perspective to preach your word and uh, Lord, we pray that you would cause us tonight to find hope and encouragement in the scriptures. Pray for your blessing on our singing and every aspect, and bless those that couldn't be with us tonight. Father, help us as a church to even more, more to more effectively reach our community with the gospel, that we might f see folks saved. And we just commit the needs needs that were presented this morning and others to you, and ask for your watch care in each situation. And we pray in Jesus' name, Amen. Let's turn to hymn 476, I Surrender All, hymn 476. All 
to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him, in his presence daily live. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus I surrender. Just a couple of announcements. Uh, we are taking a collection for Paul Connor, state representative of the PARBC. He is retiring, and we'd like to collect the offering to give it to him at the next conference, which will be September 11th through the 13th at Marsh Creek Fellowship Baptist Church at Wellsboro, PA. There's information on the back table for the conference, and the and the, the uh, container for the, uh, the offering collection is back there also. Uh, this year's men's conference will be on November 10th and 11th at Chad's Ford Baptist Church. That's a Friday and Saturday. Brochures with registration forms are on the back table, and the uh, uh, pastor says it's possibly uh, he didn't see the online registration. Maybe they will correct that. And that this time we'll have the usher come forward as you take our general offering. Or just say for the offering, yes. Our Father, we thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for providing for our needs. We ask that you bless the offering today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Amen. Thank you very much, Gene. Please take your Bibles and turn to Jeremiah chapter 4. Jeremiah chapter 4. We'll be finishing this chapter tonight, Lord willing. And we're going to begin our scripture reading at verse 25, though our attention uh, tonight will just be verses 29 through 31. So let's all stand for the reading of God's Word. Jeremiah chapter 4, beginning of verse 25. Jeremiah says, And I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. And I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord, and by his fierce anger. For thus saith the Lord, for thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. For this shall the earth mourn, the heavens above be black, because I have spoken it, I have purposed it, and will not repent, neither will I turn back from it. The whole city shall flee, for the noise of the horsemen and bowmen. They shall go into thickets, and climb up upon the rocks. Every city shall be forsaken, and not a man dwell therein. And when thou art spoiled, what wilt thou do? Though thou closest thyself with crimson, though thou deckest thee with ornaments of gold, Though, the, though thou rendest thy face with painting, in vain shalt thou make thyself fair. Thy lovers will despise thee, they will seek thy life. For I have heard a voice as of a woman in travail, and the anguish as of her that bringeth forth her first child, the voice of the daughter of Zion that bewaileth herself, that spreadeth her hands, saying, Woe is me now, for my soul is wearied because of murderers. May God bless his word. Let's, uh, let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you again for your word. And uh, we pray for your blessing upon the scriptures. Uh, Lord, we pray for those that are struggling, those with various physical ailments. Joanne, Tomkowitz, and Peg Willie uh, are on our hearts continually. We pray that you would lift them up and, and may they sense your presence and pray for your ministry to them. Thank you that that Peg has improved enough to be able to go back to her place. And we thank you, Lord, uh, for her. And I just pray that you would uh, bless those that are in need in our congregation. Draw us all near to you. Thank you for this morning. And Lord, bless us tonight. Feed us afresh from your word. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. All right, let's take our hymnals. We'll open up to him 149. He leadeth me, him 149.
last verse of 149. And when my task on earth is done, when by thy grace the victory's won, in zest away I will not flee, since God through Jordan leadeth me. Good evening. Let's take our Bibles and turn back to Jeremiah chapter 4. Thank you for coming tonight. Tonight we are looking at Jeremiah's message uh, in Jeremiah chapter 4. Three verses we're going to look at tonight. Verse 29, 30, and 31. That will conclude this chapter. Um, and uh, we are continuing this message. Just to remind you that Jeremiah was ministering to the uh, southern tribes of Judah uh, the northern tribes of Israel had already, um, about a hundred years prior to, to what uh, when when Babylon would come and take Judah away, um, they had already Assyria had already um, taken uh, Israel into captivity, and so now you've got, I want to say half a country, uh, and and now God is trying to reach them for the same sins, and He's using different preachers to warn them to repent. And he's preparing already. We already saw last week that um, the Lord has kind of decreed it at this point, at least according to the, the text that we're reading, that God is going to bring judgment. So tonight we look at three, three verses that each give different images, different pictures. Uh, as you know, the prophet uh, would, would often speak in, in, in imagery. We, we started out with three Different images, I remember one was a boiling cauldron of water that would pour out uh, from the north, and that was a picture of the judgment that was to come. And so through the, throughout this whole thing, um, God in Jeremiah has used imagery, and one of the big imageries has been that of a, of a spouse being unfaithful, and uh, God is using that to try to tell the Jews you are being unfaithful to me. We entered into a covenant relationship, and you have violated that. Now tonight we see three totally, in these verses, we see three completely different analogies, if you would. The first one really uh, is simply what's going to happen. Uh, and when you realize what's happening, uh, you, you'll see how it's connected with the next two verses. So verse 29 is the fact that uh, there's going to be an enemy coming. We already knew that. But the people in the city of Jerusalem are going to be fleeing. Uh, the place that they found refuge, the place that they looked at, their home, their security, their stability, uh, was going to be torn out from under them. Uh, and we're going to see in, in, the, in the weeks and months ahead that uh, they were certain that they had it figured out. That um, you know, if, the, if there was going to be an enemy that was going to come in like this prophet Jeremiah says... Uh, then we'll make political alliances because there's other nations around that can protect us and help defend us so we don't lead, need to leave our homes. And as time will go on, pretty soon Jeremiah gets more specific in saying, you know what, not only is it inevitable, but I'm going to tell you what country is going to come and judge you. I'm going to tell you what country you need to submit yourself to and what country you should not. And they bucked against that they were certain that they knew better than God, that they knew better than the prophet. And uh, so tonight our theme is, is refuge. Uh, uh, in fact, the title is The Wrong Rock to Hide Under. And Israel is constantly looking for security, looking for a sanctuary, looking for a place uh, where they can feel safe and at peace. And like many of mankind, they're looking in all the wrong places. So in verse 29, we have the city that they thought they would find refuge, no longer provides refuge, and they're fleeing for their lives. Then in verse 30, we switch to uh, a new picture 
of a, um, an immoral woman, a prostitute, who is getting all prettied up to, to go out uh, and, and make herself available and, and pleasurable to other men, uh, and that she's going to find love in the wrong places. And remember, we have, we have this from the perspective of her husband, Yahweh. He was in a covenant relationship with them. And now, normally, up to this point, their, their unfaithfulness has been directed at the idols, the Canaanite false gods, Ashtaroth, Moloch, Baal. Uh, Israel was so enticed by them that they began to incorporate their worship of Yahweh with uh, what was going on around them. But, but in verse 30, the idea here is more that the uh, the immoral woman is is making herself desirable uh, to please other countries that could possibly uh, give her protection from whoever this enemy is. And then in the third one, we switch. Still talking about women here, but we're talking about uh, the picture is a woman in labor, ready to deliver her first child, and uh, and she's in great agony. And as it unfolds, we realize that uh, this is really not a woman. Uh, this is just a picture of this woman giving birth in great pain, screaming, uh, and it ends up that that is the picture of the judgment that is going to come, and um, these invading armies are going to be the one that are going to be her demise. So uh, again, the title of the message is The Wrong Rock to Hide Under, and once again, we have, we, we have a lesson that, uh, of course, we're in a different country, different time, but there are so many different idols, and there are so many different possible refuges for us. You know, people, uh, Christians, seek refuge in different things. And sometimes um, other things can provide what we think is going to be protection and comfort and refuge. And in reality, uh, there's only one place where you and I can go for, for real refuge. And that is our relationship with God. So let's jump in and... Um, I think we prayed already. So, so let's talk about this idea. First of all, what is a refuge? Uh, a refuge is defined as a shelter or protection from danger. In fact, oftentimes it's used to refer to a place uh, where you find that shelter. And, of course, I'm reminded of uh, Pastor Joe, and I'm reminded of our folks during the, that are from Liberia during the war, the Civil War. And many of them found refuge in the the country to the west of them, Sierra Leone. And uh, in fact, I, I just texted Violet and James because I meant to ask them this morning and I didn't read back if they replied. Um, but I, I'm not sure how long they were in Sierra Leone, but that they actually fled their home country of Liberia and found refuge in Sierra Leone. And, and they started a church. I love the story of this. They started a church in the refuge and they called it Refuge Baptist Church. And the blessing, I mean, it's such a great thing, is Refuge Baptist Church is no longer in Sierra Leone, which is awesome. It's in Monrovia. You know, I mean, they're now back home. And uh, they're still, you know, that, that will forever be a part. You know, they will always be Refuge Baptist Church. And how appropriate that is. Not just because of how it started, but because of who their refuge is. You know, our refuge is, is, is Yahweh. It's, it's God. And Judah's refuge should have been Yahweh. Uh, and that's what God longed for. And all these illustrations and these pictures are, are God saying, I wanted, you know, how, like, he would, like, he, like Jesus would say to Israel when he came on the scene, he said, how long would I have gathered you together as a hen, like a hen with her chicks? You know, he would have protected them and, and gathered them. That's always been God's desire here for his people uh, and as Jesus said in the New Testament, and you would not. And Jeremiah could say the same thing too. Uh, so, a refuge is a shelter. We sing the song, the Lord's our rock, in him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill betide, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land. Uh, Judah was a weary land. America is a weary land. Uh, and, and Jesus is that rock. So let's jump in and look at these three, uh, Ill, these three pictures, these three images. First, verse 29, we see expectations frustrated. Let me give you the outline. Each verse, uh, I mentioned the imagery, but 
Uh, verse 29 is expectations frustrated. That is, they're, they're looking to Jerusalem and the cities that they were at, Judah, uh, for refuge. And uh, it didn't provide them that. Then we're going to look at energy expended. Verse 30 is the picture again of the immoral woman who puts all this energy in making herself beautiful so that, so that she can uh, appease, uh, again, looking at the imagery, appease these enemies that come in and, and possibly find solace. And then thirdly, we find the shelters failed. So look at verse 29, Jeremiah 4.29. The whole city shall flee for the noise of the horsemen and bowmen. They shall go into the thickets and climb up upon the rocks. Every city shall be forsaken and not a man dwell therein. This follows on what we saw. If you look back to verse 25 of this same chapter, Jeremiah 4.25, I beheld and lo, there was no man and all the birds of the heavens were fled. He's talking about in the cities. That's where they, they sought their protection. In Bible times, oftentimes cities, especially larger cities, uh, were specifically designed to offer protection and refuge against enemy because enemies were constantly prevalent. And so you'd often have cities that were set up on higher plateaus or hills, and you'd often have walled cities, uh, and that... that it was so common back then. Of course, Jerusalem was a walled city. Uh, and in fact, what would happen because the Jews did not listen to the prophets in Israel's time, and then Assyria came and took them captive, and now because the Jews will not listen to Jeremiah, uh, Judah will be brought into captivity, and Jerusalem would just be destroyed, the temple would be destroyed, the walls would be torn down, and it wouldn't be till the end of captivity when we have Nehemiah and Ezra coming in, Ezra and Nehemiah, and uh, the rebuilding of the temple, the rebuilding of the walls. But all that was only needed because Jeremiah was rejected, and these prophets were rejected. And so you, you've got, again, now you've got this city that uh, is their home. Just think of, think of how you look at your home. Our homes are our safe havens, aren't they? A uh, couple, was it last week or a couple, with, recently there were like tornado, remember? Was it just last week or the week before that? In Upper Darby there were like tornado watches, you remember that? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever been in, if you've been in here during a storm on a Sunday, uh, sometimes, especially in the back, the wind can get pretty, pretty boist, pretty strong. Sometimes the, um, the, uh, the ceiling tiles start fluttering and a couple times they'll fall out. And I remember working that night and uh, on my computer in the room and, and all of a sudden I could feel the wind pick up and all of a sudden I felt less and less secure. <laughs> I, wanna, I was thinking, okay, if, if all of a sudden the roof tears off, I'm going to run down the stairs. You know how they say you get down the stairs? And then I'm like, what am I talking about? I'm going home. <laughs> so I, I just I went home. But, you know, you think about your home is your refuge. It's your security. And, and the Jews looked at Jerusalem and the cities they were in specifically Jerusalem, that was their home, that was their refuge. And you, you and I will see in the, in the oncoming months as Jeremiah would preach to them, and Jeremiah's message became more and more clear. Look, submit yourself to this country, which was, by the way, the invader, and don't look to this country, which, by the way, was, was not who God wanted them to trust in. And no matter how much Jeremiah said it, they would eventually. They just could not get their their mind around the fact that God wanted them to submit to the invading army and allow themselves to be taken away. And so they looked to this other country. And there's a couple possibilities during that time of people that they were looking to as, you know, could this be? Could could this city be? Could this army? Could these people be the ones that are going to rescue us? And they never stepped back and asked themselves, why are we experiencing this? Why is this happening to me? Is there a God in control of everything that has something to say to me? And there was. He simply wanted them to flee to him. But they would not do that. So let's you know, talk about refuge. Cities. Cities were refuges. And in the, in the Bible, again, that idea is very clear. In fact, Proverbs 25, 28 says, uh, it's, it's a great moral lesson on people that can't control their temper. It says, he that hath no rule over his own spirit, 
is like a city that is broken down and without walls. That's a bad thing. You know, if, if you don't can't control your anger, uh, that is not a good thing. And you are like a city whose walls are broken down. In other words, you are open prey to the devil. You know, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. The Bible says, with a righteous or with an angry man, thou shalt not go. And and the picture again is of, of you know, when somebody do, can't control their temper, they're like a city that is totally vulnerable. On the other hand, there are worse cities that because they were, you know, existing during times of real peace, where there were really no threats, they didn't have walls. They didn't have bars and, and cells and stuff. And, and uh, Ezekiel would talk about that in Ezekiel 38, 11. It's kind of dreaming of a better day when there was not that need for refuge and security. And he said in Ezekiel 38, 11, And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. That was like the utopia for them. It was, wow, can you imagine not needing a place of refuge because you were at peace? That was a dream life. But here Jeremiah uses this picture. Again, verse 29, The whole city shall flee, for the noise, for the the noise of the horsemen and the bowmen, that's the invading army, which would be will be Babylon. They shall go into the thickets, climb up upon the rocks. So the idea is of all these people scattering out of the city because the invading army is coming, and all the people are fleeing for their life. Every city shall be forsaken, and not a man dwell therein. I imagine as they're looking, maybe like Lot's wife, they look back at Jerusalem. And they, they, it must have been just a devastating sight as that was their refuge. That was the place that was home. And because they would not listen to God, uh, He was going to punish them for me, with many years of captivity. And I, I, So I've thought about Jeremiah and his ministry. There is a saying that I've uh, been reminded of a lot. You've probably heard of this. It was a quote from Albert Einstein. He said the definition of, a, you, remember, you remember this, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. You've heard of that, haven't you? Uh, well, I remember reading the story of Thomas Edison and, in, and in fact, an interview that he did. Uh, and apparently Thomas Edison, when he was younger, um, his, he ended up having to be homeschooled because he, he lasted, I think, three months in school. And the teacher was so frustrated and thought, this guy is not going to learn anything. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Thomas Edison, uh, you know, the teacher said, you're not going to amount to anything. And, um, and he had to overcome a lifetime of obstacles. And uh, he ended up becoming a great inventor, as many of you know. Uh, he was famous for the invention of the incandescent light bulb. He was, uh, the, invented the, the phonograph. The fluoroscope, which is like an x-ray machine that, that uh, is not just a picture, but it's actually like moving images and all. And he, just an incredible inventor. And he was interviewed in 1921 about his inventions. And he described his persistence this way, and I'm going to quote. He said, after we had conducted thousands of experiments on a certain project, without solving the problem, one of my associates, after we had conducted the crowning experiment and it had proved a failure, expressed discouragement and disgust over having failed to find out anything. And you can imagine. You can imagine if you've tried thousands of times and, it, and you're trying a new way to, and it, it just does not work. What was his response? He said, I cheerily assured him that we had learned something. For we had learned for a certainty that the thing couldn't be done that way and that we would have to try some other way. Man, that's, that's incredible, isn't it? Now I go back to that with my mind. I think of, of the quote from um, Albert Einstein. Or no, was that Albert? Who was the one that gave the first quote? Albert Einstein. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again. And, and that's not what um, Thomas Edison did. You know, I mean, he kept trying, but he kept adapting and, and trying different ways. I thought of Jeremiah, you know, and as I've been studying this, I'm looking at Jeremiah's ministry. 
he wasn't he wasn't a prophet for like five years. You know, the last five years of Judah, he's there to warn them, and uh, he was there for years, for decades, preaching the same message. And and because of all the different angles, God was so gracious in saying. I imagine maybe one day he woke up and he said, okay, Jeremiah, I got a new image that you can present to try to get them to get this. You know, and, and so he's, he's going to have all kinds of images and pictures. But I can just imagine how frustrated um, Jeremiah must have been thinking, waking up and saying, all right, Lord, you got, got anything new that I can tell these people? Because I'm preaching the same thing. <laughs> if, I turn, if, you, if you would, real quickly, keep your place here. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 2. And, and I, I may have already been here in this series and I may go back because this Ezekiel, uh, though uh, not exactly the same time period as Jeremiah, the same people he was ministering to, the same results, uh, the same frustrations he must have experienced. And um, I imagine that Jeremiah... You know, he needed this message too that God gave to Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 3 and following. The same type of thing that Jeremiah had to keep in mind. Ezekiel chapter 2 and verse 3. And he, that's God, said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel. Jeremiah was the children of Israel, but remember specifically Judah. This was the, the northern tribes. So I send you to the children of Israel to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me, even unto this very day. For they are impotent children and stiff-hearted. I, I, I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. It's exactly what Jeremiah's mission was. You, you say what I say. And they, look at verse 5 now, and they... Whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there hath been a prophet among them. That's not what Ezekiel wanted to hear. That's not what Jeremiah wanted to hear. You know, he wanted to hear that my word is so powerful that it is going to break through, it is going to humble them, and they are going to see the light. That wasn't God's message. In fact, God left it open-ended, didn't he? He said, whether they will hear, whether they obey. It's like he's saying, who knows? He knows, and that's why he's saying what he's saying. They are a rebellious house. There verse 5 again. Yet shall they know that there hath been a prophet among them. You know what? God's, you know how God, uh, it, the Bible says, my word shall not return unto me void. In Isaiah, God's, God says that. But it shall accomplish that which I've set, just like the rain that comes down. You know, when we quote that, I, we often are hoping that every time we use God's word, it won't return void and people will get saved every time. But, you know, God has a bigger plan and a bigger program. And he understands there's going to be people like Judah that are not going to want our message. But God does not say, listen... I understand this, that you know, there's going to come time they're going to reject you, so you're off, you're done. No, he's still, he's challenging them. Whether they will hear or whether they will not. Look at verse 6. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions. That was Ezekiel's environment, but that was Jeremiah's environment. Mm -hmm. He was preaching... Um, you know how they say in court, we have a hostile witness. In other words, you're asking someone to, to give testimony on your side, but they're not in favor of it. They're a hostile witness. Well, the people of Judah and the people of Israel were hostile witnesses. You know, Jeremiah is called to preach to them specifically, and they didn't want to hear it. It's like you're dwelling among scorpions. At the end of verse 6, Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks. This is, you know, this is good for young preachers. I remember hearing this. It can be intimidating when you start preaching and you look at, you're looking back at a bunch of blank faces, you know, and you have no idea, you know, what are these people thinking of me? And sometimes you get people that respond, but most most time people are just thinking of what you're saying and they're just blank stares. 
And I, over the years now, I've been doing this for, you know, many years now, uh, and there have been some people that have been like stone cold and I never could read them. And I realize this too, because sometimes I might look at someone that I think is, boy, they're stubborn and they're obstinate. Just look at the way, look at their face. And, and I've come to realize that their heart may not, their, their face may, may not read what's on their heart. And there's also people that may look like they're following and they're right there with me and they're not. So it doesn't matter is what Ezekiel is being told. And it's what Jeremiah had to keep in mind. Again, look at verse 6. Thou son of man, be not afraid of them. Neither be afraid of their words. Uh, though thou dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of their words again, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. And thou shalt speak my words unto them, verse 7, whether they will hear, whether they will forbear. It's again twice. In other words, here's what I want you to do. You say what I want you to say. How they respond is none of your business. Leave the results to me. Again, he says, for they are most rebellious. He's telling Ezekiel, they're not going to listen to you. And now verse 80 concludes, and this is the same thing Jeremiah needed as well. But thou son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house, Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. Saying, you know what, Ezekiel? Just tell them what I want you to tell them. And how they respond is my business. It's, they were my people. I'm dealing with them. But don't you be rebellious. Can you imagine Ezekiel, Jeremiah? Imagine preaching for like a couple years. And, and you're just, you, you, you're like preaching to scorpions. You know? I imagine maybe some of the scorpions were some of the things that people would say based on his messages that, you know, that were like scorpion bites, you know, they were not receiving his message. Jeremiah and Ezekiel didn't get people coming up saying, that was a great message, that was a real blessing, you know. Actually, we'll go into this one differently, or down the road, there was a degree of that in Ezekiel where the people actually, um, and I'm sure I'll get to this sometime in this series, where the people actually did Say, you got to come hear this preacher. So there was some of that, somehow. Uh, and, but the, the complaint in that text in Ezekiel was, they come to you as a preacher that will come. In other words, they love to hear your words. They love to hear your words. They tell everyone to come and hear, but they will not do them. So, and, and that's exactly, maybe that's what happened with Jeremiah. You know, maybe he got some people that uh, said some nice things, but the bottom line was, um, they were hostile witnesses. He was preaching to a hostile pe people. So let's move on to, to Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 30 now. Uh, energy expanded, expended. Now we switch to the picture of an immoral woman getting all dialed up for a night on the town. Uh, this is an immoral woman that is married, that is in a covenant relationship. Um, and, and you remember the picture of Hosea? That he had the tougher job than Jeremiah. Hosea had to marry a prostitute, Gomer, just so that he could be an illustration of exactly how God viewed Israel and Judah's uh, rebellion. So now look at verse 30. When thou, when thou art spoiled, in other words, when the army comes in and spoils you and devastates you and destroys you, when, when, when this happens that you're fleeing, that I have brought judgment, what wilt thou do? And now here comes the next image. Though thou closest, clothest thyself with crimson, though thou deckest thy thee with ornaments of gold, it's a picture of someone ready to, to have a, a real night out on the town. Though thou rentest thy face with painting, that's an English, an old English word, and, and it can be confusing, but don't stumble over it. Uh, she's not renting. Rent, to rent usually means to tear. They rent their clothes. She's not tearing her face. The idea of the word rent, is, uh, the old English word, the root word, literally means to separate. And, and what this is talking about clearly is, um, you know, what women do with their eyes to set them out. The word separate, has the, the word rend has the idea of to separate. And that's what they're doing with makeup. That's all it was. I guess eyeliner and stuff. You know, they were making their eyes look bigger. That's all this phrase means. Thou rentest thy face with painting. In vain shalt thou make thyself fair. Thy lovers will despise thee. They will seek thy life. One commentator said this. We see the woman taking care of her appearance, putting on clothing, jewelry, and makeup as if ready to go out and enjoy herself. The city's paramours, or lovers, 
are the allies who she, she might think will be her deliverance. Whom were you thinking of? He, this is the commentator. Jerusalem. Were you thinking of Egyptians, your cousins, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Edomites? You are in for a rude awakening. At best, they despise you. Actually, they will join in with Babylonians when the day comes. They will seek your life. And that's this picture in verse 30. They're getting all dialed up uh, to make themselves beautiful, fair. Thy lovers, the people that they are trying to appease, the people that they are thinking to allure and get to help them. And in this case, it's not the, the false gods of the, of the Canaanites. In this case, it's the other potential countries around them that could be alliances against the enemy. And, and they will, that will be a major stumbling block. Later on in Jeremiah, we will see a group of the leaders rally together and they are so in despair now because now they know Babylon's coming and they're going to be the enemy. I'll give you a little foresight. And they're thinking Egypt is going to be the country that's going to del deliver them. Mm -hmm. And they all go to Jeremiah and they said, listen, Jeremiah, we just want to hear from God. This was after years and years and years of Jeremiah's preaching what we've been hearing. And they're going to say, Jeremiah, we just want to hear from God. You tell us what God says and we're good with it. Mm -hmm. And Jeremiah says, you know, basically, are you, you, you sure... And they're like, yes, we promise. So he goes, the next day he comes back. He says, Here, here's what God says. Submit, put yourself, submit to Babylon. Don't look to Egypt. And they said, that's not what God said. So they, they rejected it. I love that, love that text. But here, this is a picture of that. And, and here she's getting all dialed up to try to appease and please the very nations that are going to be her destruction. Thy lovers will despise thee. They will seek thy life. You know, what we sometimes think is a safe haven is not always a safe haven. Just recently in the news, last month, you may have heard of this, that a family died living off the grid. Does that sound familiar? That's the way the, the headlines were. Uh, it was in Colorado. Uh, the title in the New York Times, this article was, The Family Died in the Rockies After Trying to Live Off the Grid. It was two sisters, one of the sisters' children, um, in fact, let me read part of this. Last summer, so this was like last July, Rebecca Vance talked with her family about a dream she'd had. She wanted to live in a land disconnected from the world, which she viewed as chaotic and dangerous. She was fed up. She was fed up with this world, the daily news streams, politics, COVID, all that stuff's going on, and she just wanted to escape. And uh, so she had this idea that uh, she and her teenage son would be happy if they live safely away from the news, the viruses, the politics of modern day America. And, um, and so they went not really super far in, uh, in, a, in Gold Creek Campground in western Colorado. It, I read that it's like an hour away from civilization, but not super far. And they tried to live out the, w the, the winter in tents camping. Mm. They lived in the wilderness. And they, they thought... They just wanted to get away from the cacophony of life. They just wanted to live off the grid. And the, in fact, one of their relatives said they, they intended well, they meant well, but it ended up costing them their lives. They tried to live through the winter, and they, they were found uh, frozen to death, malnourished. Uh, all three of them had died. And, and how sad it is. They're thinking, you know, in, in her mind, she's thinking, I want to get away from this world and she ended up, what she thought was going to be a, a, a refuge, a haven, ended up being her demise. Much like Judah, you know. They're, they're, the things that they thought, the things that they looked to, to be their refuge, to be their rock and shelter in a time of storm, ended up being their demise. And if only they had taken heed to this man crying in the wilderness, Jeremiah, who tried to warn them. Last verse, verse 31. First we had expectations frustrated, verse 29. The city was no longer a refuge. Then we have energy expended in verse 30, getting all dialed up, like, you know, spending all this energy and making themselves beautiful to try to appease someone that would end up being their demise. And now we have shelters failed. Look at verse 31. Now it's a picture, uh, initially, of a woman giving birth. For I've heard a voice, as of a woman in travail, 
and the anguish as of her that bringeth forth her first child, the voice of the daughter of Zion that bewaileth herself, that spreadeth her hands, saying, Woe is me now, for my soul is wearied because of murderers. Wow, this turned quickly. You know, first it's a picture of someone giving child their firstborn, usually the most difficult pregnancy uh, since they've not delivered before. And she's, she's bewailing. Uh, she spreads out her hands saying, Woe is me, my soul is wearied. And then we see that it is because of the murderers. One writer says this. He says, Jerusalem is trying to anticipate the future and make it work her way. Everything Jeremiah preaches is designed to get Jerusalem's attention uh, to come to its senses. He draws attention to a different woman, but it will turn out to be the same woman. It is Miss Zion, whose voice he has heard. But like a woman writhing in labor, the woman in distress is having her first baby. Although Miss Zion is like a woman giving birth, in the way she's crying out, it is not actually a description of Miss Zion giving birth. Miss Zion, that's the Jews, is experiencing the fate that often comes from the victims of invasion. He, uh, hers is not a cry like the cry of a woman in labor, but the cry of a woman that is being assaulted. And uh, so what was happening? Why, 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 why these pictures? These are very gruesome, very shocking pictures. And intended to be that way, to get the attention of God's people. He's trying to face, shock them into understanding the reality. And folks, understand through this whole time, Yahweh God was wanting to be their refuge. He would have been their refuge in a time of storm. He withered, would have gathered them together like a hen with her chicks and provided her the security if only they had submitted to what God said. But instead they were convinced they knew better they were going to do it their way. They rejected God's message and it ended up not to their benefit. One last example, and this also, so many things in the news that have popped in my mind here as I've, I've read the news things. Uh, this came out June 30th, just, uh, just over a month ago. Uh, maybe you heard about this. It was um, the sinking of a dangerously overcrowded fishing boat carrying hundreds of immigrants near Greece's coast. Uh, on June 13th, a plane spotted a fishing boat in international waters near Greece. And it was heavily overcrowded. In fact, you can see a picture and a video of it. Uh, it, it was somewhat, you know, it was a fishing boat, so it was a pretty good-sized boat. It wasn't like a rowboat. But, I mean, people were shoulder to shoulder. They were packed like sardines. And you could see it from the, from the plane, the view. Uh, it was so overcrowded, and it was navigating at slow speed. And so the helicopter, the police, rather, that took the... the, the the plane, warned the um, Italian and Greek officials who sighted the boat. And so they, they, they kind of out, called out a mayday to go and rescue these people because it, it looked like it was not going to last long. And they estimated that the vessel was carrying between 400 to 750 immigrants. And they, it did not look like a safe situation. And so the Greek Coast Guard said it asked nearby vessels to assist uh, the fishing trawler and so several, several different boats went up to them uh, to, to ask, you know, we could take some of your people. But it says the migrants on the boat rejected the assistance offer and said they wanted to continue their journey to Italy. Mm. The next day, June 14th, Coast Guard said the, the fishing boat capsized and sank roughly 47 nautical miles from the coastal city of Pylos. Uh, they said the engine had failed, and uh, so then a rescue effort um, was underway. Now remember, there were 400 to like 750 people. 104 were pulled survivors, and they only found 82 bodies. So like they lost 100. They, uh, some of the immigrants were from Afghanistan, Egypt, Libya, uh, Palestine, Palestinian territories. In fact, one, one town in Pakistan... Uh, they said, lost an entire generation of its young men that were on that ship. Now think about that. These men are looking for freedom. They're looking for deliverance, you know, from where they're, ho their homeland. They're the ones fleeing. And they're looking at Italy. Italy is going to be the, that's where we're going to find a safe haven. 
And they didn't realize that these boats that were coming were their rescue, their refuge. Kind of reminded me of the Titanic. If you remember that story, you remember that as the, this huge sit, sit, uh, ship is sinking, people, many people, were reluctant to go on these little lifeboats and be lowered into this huge sea because they felt so much safer on the Titanic. And some of them, you know, didn't get in. And in reality, those little boats were more of a refuge, weren't they? And so, too, Judah is so convinced that they know best. They know how to worship God the way they wanted to worship God. And God, you better accept it. They knew who to look to uh, to, to quiet and, and, and ease their conscience from the babblings of this prophet. They knew better than God. And unfortunately, when the, when the punishment would come, it would be a long, hard lesson and, and you know praise God that I don't get in Jeremiah and there's none of it even at the end of Jeremiah where he says I told you so you know but can you imagine how much he must have wanted to say that after all those years uh, but praise God for a faithful prophet that told people not what they wanted to hear but what they needed to hear let's pray father help us to be attentive not to our own way we're already attentive to that Help us to, to not be secure and in, in, in magnify certainty as, as so many people today uh, have exchanged the pursuit of truth for the pursuit of certainty. And uh, Father, I pray that you would help us to always be teachable. Never to be so arrogant as to think there's something we don't know. And Father, may we elevate your word, the preaching of your word, above our own human reasoning. Help us, Lord, to trust in you with all our heart and lean not unto our own understanding. In all our ways, help us to acknowledge you and you will direct our paths. Thank you, Lord. We ask your blessing in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, let's stand and, and take out your hymn books. We will close in song. Yeah.